Tired of doing the same thing day after day? Seeing the same people talk about the same things? Hearing politicians promise the same BS? Don't let anybody tell you that it's corporations and businesses that create jobs. My change in party will enable me to be re-elected. Too many OBGYNs aren't able to practice their, their love with women all across this country. Well, you don't have to anymore. Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, your guide to traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, where we talk about living the life that you want to live where you want to live it. From beautiful San Miguel de Allende, smack in the middle of Mexico. With your hosts, Jonathan Lockwood and James Guzman. Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, traveling, investing, and living beyond borders. Jonathan Lockwood here along with James Guzman. What's happening, James? How you doing? Well, what's happening today here in San Miguel de Allende and all weekend is Day of the Dead. Yeah, absolutely. I've been having a great time over here. We've had it for the last uh, two or three days. I think really the festivities started on Thursday and uh, now it's Sunday. We still got today's things the last day, but uh, it seemed to culminate in a a huge party last night. That was pretty crazy. It was probably about 500 people out there, huh? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's been interesting for me because I've never really focused on holidays. I didn't grow up with them. And uh, so I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't really think about it. But my gosh, this Day of the Dead thing is not only huge, it's huge here in San Miguel de Allende. What is the term that they have for all of the tourists who come in from Mexico City? They call them chilangos, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's Chilangos. And so I think the city has been full of them. So it's impossible to get a parking spot. You know, you have to take cabs. And uh, yeah, I went to that party last night too, and it was yeah, amazing. Yeah, how about that, that? Did you see the uh, the heart player? And the, they had, right in the center of town, they had a heart player stretching all the way from the uh, the parochia. Right. And it's just a, a harp that I've never seen anything well, like it. Well, here's the as, thing. Here's you know. the thing. She was probably very talented. Right. You know, it was she played very well. But the interesting thing to me was, how the hell did they do that? I don't know. So, folks, if you can picture this, these strings were strung from the Hardeen. If you ever see any pictures of San Miguel here, uh, this area of the Hardeen strung way up to the focal church in the middle of town, the parochia. All of these strings, str- I, I, I shudder to think how long those strings stretched. And so they also had these little uh, sort of uh, uh, little bridge things hanging from them at certain points, which I take it, give the, the harp its, uh, its musical ability to shift, you know, in tone. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of spooky and cool. So, uh, yeah, yeah, she was very talented, but the idea that they created something is whoever would have thought of something. Yeah. Like I've never seen anything like it. And then, you know, you have all the people walking around the children and the families dressed up, uh, you know, these Katrinas and other types of like stuff like that, everybody taking pictures. So it's just a, yeah. it's a good time in general. It's fantastic. I mean, you couldn't, you just can't, it was so alive and beautiful. I just said, I, I can't disgrace these scenes by taking pictures with my dumb little phone. Right. And then putting them on Facebook but or something. But you did though, didn't you? I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so anyway, speaking of San Miguel de Allende, we have with us today, Philip Hardcastle, who is the owner and director of Realty San Miguel. Philip has a long history in real estate, construction, and sales. He worked as a design builder for over 28 years, owned his own company for most of that time in Texas, Hawaii, Cambodia, and Mexico. He's a bit of a jack of all trades, uh, also a skilled carpenter, builder of fine furniture. He was born and raised in Texas, attended A&M University, where he studied architecture. As a young man, he moved to Hawaii, where he ran a successful construction company for 10 years. He then returned to Texas, where he developed a strong reputation in residential construction. He is currently a full-time resident of San Miguel de Allende. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You betcha. First, first, you know, I want to congratulate you on your your good, strong name that you have there. That's (sighs) an accomplishment. Yes. Unfortunately, it's not something that I did myself. I I just inherited that, but I do like it. So, you know, I I just thought you'd be a a good guest with us because, uh, you know, you've lived in lots of different interesting places. Uh, and you've started successful companies. You have a very successful um, real estate company here in town. And um, so that's the kind of uh, people that we like to talk to, you know, people that have actually done what others might be uh, what might be thinking about as far as uh, leaving their home country, uh, starting successful businesses. And I thought also you might be able to shed a little uh, light on the real estate market in, uh, in Mexico. 
you know, how, you know, a lot of people don't know about it, don't know how they might be able to buy or even maybe work in the real estate market. So, well, uh, why don't, yeah. and so why don't we just start off with that first question, Philip? Um, when did you leave the U.S. and can you tell us why? The, uh, the first time I left, um, well, actually, in, in many ways, I moved to Hawaii and it's kind of funny because many people would say, oh, when, when I lived in Hawaii, my friends in the, in the mainland would say, well, when are you coming back to the U.S.? <laughs> and so, um, but maybe Hawaii was a stepping stone because it is very uh, multicultural. You know, only at the time, I think maybe 23% of the population were Caucasian mm -hmm. and a lot of Japanese, Chinese and um, Filipinos and well, from all over. And I think this was kind of my first exposure to different cultures. And from there, I would travel. It was very easy to, it was just as easy to travel to Asia as it would be to the United States. So I might go to Australia or New Zealand or, or, or uh, Japan or China or Korea or whatever. So that was kind of the exposure. And for me personally, I really love, I love being in this uncomfortable place. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it, it kind of came quite natural for me to work in, within other cultures. And sometimes, uh, like I also did a little project in New Zealand, and this wasn't me going and starting a business, but um, I just took it as this challenge. So I went and did it. Good for you. And so you moved to Hawaii. How old were you? Uh, I was 23. Okay when I moved to Hawaii. And I was there 12 years um, before I moved back to Texas. And then from there, um, Cambodia for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And Cambodia was like the Wild West at the time. The, the, the UN had actually been there for six years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, you know, those that preceded me, maybe they would say, oh no, it was very calm by the time you were there. but. Um, it was an amazing place, and I like the I like the cultural challenges. I like, like I said, I like the discomfort mm -hmm. of maybe not, well, for sure, not speaking the language fluently, for having to investigate. Then it, um, at the same time, business is challenging enough as it is, right. and you combine that with going to another country and another culture and another language. Um, it can be incredibly challenging, but when you go, James and I were talking before we started this, um, the broadcast just a little while ago, and I was just commenting that the more third world the country is, the more opportunity. Mm. And so, for instance, if you had the idea of starting a business in the United States, you know, maybe I would have two or three options out there for me. Mm. But the idea of going to Cambodia, there were hundreds. It's wow. just like, just pick one. Because there was, there's so many needs and people will pay. And now Mexico, in comparison to Cambodia, um, is a lot more developed. And so there's not near as many opportunities. But there's still a lot of opportunities. What did you do in Cambodia then? Uh, I designed and built a series of buildings for an NGO, mm -hmm. and so that was that was it. When I first arrived, I had no idea if we were going to be needing to import everything from Thailand or Singapore or what we could even buy there. So my first month, I was out on the street all day just talking to people, trying to figure out what we could, materials we could source there and what we were going to have to bring in and... And then at night, I'd be in the, in the motel room with a little portable drafting board. Boy, that sounds good and uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, you know what? It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, so, I, you know, I actually haven't been to Cambodia, but I hear a lot of people talking about it. A lot of people saying that it's a great place, uh, especially for young people that are looking for opportunities. Uh, and uh, I, I think what you are referring to earlier is just kind of like less competition uh, you know, in the United States, there seems to be less and less people uh, that are having disposable income to pay for all these things while there's more and more uh, entrepreneurs, lo people looking for any way to make money. Um, 
uh, in the U.S. So if you go to some of these more underdeveloped markets, the skills that you have uh, actually uh, are you know outweigh uh, most of the people there. So you can go and uh, find a lot of opportunities that that others can't. Yes, that's true. And then another element that's combined with that, uh, depending on your age. Cambodia and maybe maybe even Mexico, maybe many countries in the world. Like I know there's some opportunities in Spain right now. Um, you're, you're really going to get people in their 20s and 30s, pre-kids moving there. And then you're not going to get, uh, then the next generation that might move there and compete against you would be ones where their kids have already left. It, for the most part, you don't see a lot of families move, picking up and moving with their kids when their kids are 10, 12, 14 years old. It's just not a convenient time for them. So in a sense, even outsiders going into a country to start a business, they're, they're somewhat limited. And as I'm saying that, I'm also thinking about how many young couples there are with families that are moving here to San Miguel de Ande. You know, so in a sense, it's like, well, maybe that's not true always. Right. But... But yeah, absolutely. Your kids are going to be a uh, a major factor. You know, if you have kids and and you might think about doing. I I think that you said that the kids have always been kind of a, a major factor in uh, where you chose to live and stuff like that. So something you have to keep in mind. I mean, some of the the things that we have online as far as maybe education or uh, things that weren't available in the past may make it easier uh, to travel with kids or live in different places. But uh, it sure is. Definitely a, a big factor. I mean, I don't know. I don't have kids, so I don't. Right. Well, yeah. The ki- you know the kids are a, the important factor for everyone. Like I had an opportunity to move back to Cambodia when my kids are young, and I just I just couldn't do it. Uh, and Cambodia, in comparison to say Mexico, it just felt very unsafe. It's like many of the couples that were living there, they had a guard sleeping on their front porch. They had a driver. Many of the women, most of the women had drivers, and many of the men had drivers. And it, it just feels like this isn't a great environment for my kids. Mm. So I opted out of Cambodia when my kids were younger, and you know, a few years later, here we moved to Mexico. Right. So well, I mean, while it was a challenge, it wasn't impossible, obviously, because you were able to uh, live in different places and start your own in companies in these places. So it's, well, you know, it's uh, again another one of these challenges that you like to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. I like the discomfort. Yeah. Right, right, right. Well, good for you. Well, I take the discomfort as a challenge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. good. And, and you know, the fact of the matter is the reason why more people don't do it is because they're the opposite of you. Very uncomfortable with change. Yes, yeah. I, I agree. But So, so you, you spent a dozen years in Hawaii. You came back to the U.S. You were in Dallas uh-huh. at that point. And then you stayed a little while, and then you, you, you went to Cambodia, but you were sort of traveling back and forth between Texas and Cambodia, right? Yes. You had those projects going, and then did you co- stay back in Texas after that, or at what point did you move to Mexico? Um, Texas, I, the whole time, including when I was working in Cambodia for four and a half years, so it was nine years, and then we moved to Mexico. Okay. And uh, actually, we came... Quite by accident, I had a delay in a project, and like many other people, um, in my project, I had nothing to do for three weeks, and some friends were down here, and they said, oh, you guys come down. And so we came down to San Miguel de Ende, and like many other people, we just absolutely fell in love with the place. And we were kind of bored in Dallas anyway. Mm. Um, And so... We were here maybe four or five days and um, started looking at the schools for the kids. And within two weeks, we had made the decision we're moving to San Miguel. All right. And so uh, we actually moved here. Um, and I didn't start a business or didn't start working for maybe nine months. Right. And I was fortunate that in two ways. One, that I had some money set aside, and the second, that San Miguel's incredibly cheap place to live. Especially at that time. What year was this? Uh, that was 2004. Okay. And and it's an incredibly cheap place to live. And so I just spent maybe seven months researching what, what was available. So I came down here having no idea how I was going to make income, <laughs> uh, or even if I could make income. 
Did you speak Spanish? No. 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 So I didn't speak any Spanish. I didn't know what I was going to do. What I saw, though, was this baby boomer market and just understanding the demographics and the baby boomers, the baby boom started after the end of World War II. And then the I think the last year of the baby boomers is those born in 1963. Right. And so what I saw in that was that, for example, the the tail end of the baby boomers will not begin retiring until 2028. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there'll be this huge baby boomer market till 2035 before it even tops out. I see. And so what so in a sense I say, well, I had no idea what I was going to do. Well, I wasn't stupid either. <laughs> you know, and I and I think James and I were talking before the uh, before the show today about you know what would I advise other people and it's like do the market research and on the area you're going on the on the economy in general and I'd already been doing market research not just not on Mexico but just in general and I so I realized that this with my age and the demographics of the baby boomers. If I got into some kind of business that service served the baby boomers, that it would continue to increase and rise throughout my career. Mm. Now, would I encourage my kids to do something? My, you know, my son's twenty-one. Would I encourage him to get in on the baby boom generation? Something that serves them right now? Well, maybe. But he's only going to be halfway into his career when it dies. And then he's built a business around something, you know, perfect world. You can find a, some kind of niche that's going to be this increasing market. Right. So and you're, you're, so that's, that's the mainly what I saw. And that's what gave me the confidence to come here without knowing what to do. You're, you're close to 10 years into this then. Yeah, I'm 10 years. And, and were you right? Did you, did you, were you right? Uh, yeah, you I was actually maybe a little premature. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so certainly after the 2008 crisis, uh, we were suffering. But, you know, most of my friends in business in the U.S. were suffering also. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a really good lesson for people to take also as far as starting businesses. Uh, you know, you always hear these statistics that, I don't know what people always say, six to one, uh, you know, out of six businesses, uh, five of them shut down, only one of them uh, remain after two years or something like that, people say. Well, a majority of them do no sort of uh, market research. They don't test the market. And um, so, I, you know, I think that's a really a, a, a huge thing you could do, one of the first things uh, to see if you have a, a viable idea or not. Yeah. I spent seven months researching um, researching San Miguel and the opportunities available and I think when I was done, I had a list of maybe 65 to 75 businesses that I felt like were absolutely viable in San Miguel. The problem is, at the time, San Miguel is a very small town. And so even though all 75 of these businesses were viable, the majority of them would only produce maybe a quarter to a half of income. Mm -hmm. So... You know, it's almost like you needed to start two of them at the same time, which complicates more. But, um, but in a sense, that's also played into my market because I'm selling. I'm working with um, within the real estate company. There's 15 of us. There are younger people coming. There's people, both Mexican and Gringos, that are coming. But we're primarily catering to uh, a baby boomer market, and so there's. A lot of people come down and they're retirees, quote unquote, but they really don't want to retire. Mm. So they're absolutely thrilled when they can start a little business and make a, a third or a half right. of an income. Beautiful. It's perfect for them. Right. And, uh, and then there's some that make several incomes. Mm. You know, it's not like all the businesses are that way. I mean, there's some people that are making mm. some nice money here. Beautiful. So um, you are real estate, uh, excuse me, it's called Realty San Miguel is the name of your, your business. And how's it doing today? Uh, we're doing great. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the, you know, the first baby boomers, um, 
started to retire in 2011. You know, and of course, it's all a transition. And But, you know, 2011, January 1, all the news outlets were saying from today for the next, what is it, 23 years or something, 10,000 people a day will be retiring. Mm. And so we only need a small fraction of those. And what really what's making, there's kind of two levels of the market here that make it a very desirable market um, or successful market is one, there's kind of the lower end market that I'll say is 250 and below. Mm. Uh, what's 250? $250,000 and below. Okay. Yeah, and that's a big market. Right. And then there's also a big market in, say, the 250 to, say, 750. Mm. And it's really two different types of people. The, You know, when I left Texas, or the nine years I was in Texas, I had several friends, and most of them upgraded their house and the size of their mortgage two or three times mm. in the same nine years wow. that I owned mine. And for me, I was trying to pay mine off. I didn't want to upgrade. I wanted to own it outright. Mm. And that was, you know, there was probably 10 great reasons that brought us to San Miguel. But one of them was um, I was aggressively paying my mortgage off on my house in Texas. And, and as I started seeing the light at the end of the tunnel that, you know, in three or four more years, this house could be 100% mine, I'm realizing I'm going to have $10,000 a year or 12 or 15 in property tax and oh, maintenance yeah. right. on a house that I own outright. And I'm like, something's wrong with this picture. And uh, realistically, I was, my house, when we sold it, it was a little around 200000 In Dallas? In Dallas. Okay. Yeah, 200000 And if you budgeted in for an air conditioning system and roofing and and the property taxes and just normal maintenance, it would be a thousand dollars a month. Mm. The average Social Security payment, I think, is one thousand two hundred dollars a month. Yeah. And so when so what I'm saying that our two markets, the two hundred and fifty and below, these are mainly people who have quite a bit of equity or have their house paid for. Mm. They're able to sell their house in the U.S. and they come here. Uh, my property taxes on my house are about $212 a year. Wow. And I would say 60% of the people I know do not insure their home. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's concrete. It's not going to burn. If it floods, you open the door and sweep the water out. You know, it's <laughs> like, you know, unless you have wood floors. I mean, there's just not a lot. Uh, maybe some people have liability insurance. Uh -huh. Um, but then there's another market that I was saying from say this, the 250 to 750, some, something in that price range. These are also people that are, sometimes it's their second home, but many times it's their, their only home. They sell what they have in the U S and San, Mel, San Miguel is a place where I like to say more life, less money. Mm. The cult, the cultural opportunities here are just amazing. The, um, but you, you can go do twice as much entertaining from eating out to going to shows, to a play, to the opera. Absolutely. And you can do twice as much as you would in the U.S. for about a third of the money. Yeah, I, I have a question about that, what you're saying. Um, I was talking to uh, another guy uh, a few, couple weeks ago who's down in Costa Rica. He was also helping a uh, similar thing, but in Costa Rica as far as people... Normally, Americans are just uh, from other countries like that uh, coming, looking for maybe a place to retire in Costa Rica. He said that in 2008, he saw a giant uh, collapse in the amount of people that were coming down there because they were planning on selling their houses up there or, you know, it, somehow they were going to mortgage it that way. And, and that uh, dream. Right. Away from no, that, that just didn't happen. So have you seen the same? The same thing, thing happened here yeah. in 2008. The uh, the. The data from the public registry, where all the deeds are registered, from 2007 to 2008, 70 percent of the sales went away. Hmm. You know, and and 2007, that was just about the time I was getting in the real estate. I don't know what the percentage was, but it was probably close to 40 or 50 percent 
were getting a second mortgage on their house there and buying a house here mm -hmm. or a equity line of credit or um and you know all of that just died like i used to have clients that would say we would go look at houses and they'd say great we'd love this house can we go back to your office and use your computer I said, sure. And yeah, we want to apply for a loan. And they would sit there for 30 minutes and go, okay, we're accepted for $280,000. Mm -hmm. Like, great. You know, but I, that changed. I, I'm the newest uh, transplant here to San Miguel and to Mexico. And, and there are a lot of people, just like you say, who are just uh, salivating over the idea of moving to a place like this, moving to Mexico. They have a lot of questions, and I want to ask you about those questions in just a moment. Okay. And uh, James has also, you know, worked in real estate in the area too. Maybe you both can help people who are, at least in the U.S., maybe anywhere else too, uh, get the answers to their questions about what they need to know about moving here. Uh, but first, we want to say hello to our sponsor here. Today's Borderless Podcast is brought to you by The Condescending Group, your online leader in promoting moral superiority. The Condescending Group is a jaw-dropping collection of some of the most wonderfully high and mighty people you've ever run into. The comfortable thing is that few, if any, have actually accomplished anything in the real world. But they don't think that should stop them from telling you how to run your life. Blog posts, video series, and more, all with one thing in mind, showing you how to feel good about yourselves with the least effort possible. The Condescending Group, they care more than you. Okay, so we'll get back to uh, Philip Hardcastle on the Borderless Podcast, owner and director of Realty San Miguel. Philip, um, so we're, when we left off, we talked about the fact that a lot of people in the U.S. would love to come move to Mexico and maybe a place just like San Miguel de Allende. But for instance, I want to lead off with what almost everyone tells me in the States. And it appears to be a myth from what I'm told. Even people who seem to be very well informed generally about things will say, well, you know, you can't own real estate in Mexico. Is that true? That it, that's not true. W where did that come from? Um, it probably came from, there is a law on the books that uh, within, I believe it's a thousand meters of the beach areas and the border, I believe. It's a little bigger, it's a little larger at the border um, that foreigners can own the land. You know, they didn't want to see all the beaches controlled by the foreigners. Hmm. And so what people would do, would they would they would buy it in a bank trust. Mm. And that right there would probably add at least 5000 if not more, to the cost of the purchase. Plus, then there's a main, uh, an annual fee to maintain this trust. But we're on the interior mm -hmm. um, at um, maybe 6,300 foot elevation. And here, it's fee simple. Right. And so basically, foreigners can own... Um, any property, it's it's not a problem at all. Okay, so let's just dispel that myth once and for all. Anyone listening to this who heard you can't own property in Mexico, it is absolutely categorically untrue. It is Even based with on a tourist a, visa, yeah. by the way. Right. <laughs> yeah, you can uh, you can own it with a tourist visa. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and another thing, um, you know, because I I was selling uh, real estate in Acapulco, so it we did have to set up these trusts, and the trusts are not hard to set up at all. Uh, I believe the maintenance fee, you know, is around three hundred dollars a year, um, but uh, you know it's a trust. It's fine. I mean, there's not, you know, you might want to set up a trust to to hold your real estate. In uh, in, in any case, uh, you know, it's, it might be a good idea if if it's a second or third home. Um, right, you're right. The trust or even the trust are not a big deal. Yeah, and uh, they, uh, I believe, a year and a half ago, the House approved a bill to get rid of the trust. It was going through the Senate. And uh, uh, I have not heard again what happened, but uh, I know that it, everybody seemed to be on board with getting rid of that. So um, I think that uh, soon they will be getting rid of that. But even if it's not, it's not. It's really not a big deal. Okay. So there we go. We're done. With, so what else? You know, you're in touch with this. Say a, uh, maybe it's a 45, 55-year-old couple come here, they're visiting friends, and uh, they sit down with you or they bump into you somehow. They say, hey, Philip can help you out here. What questions typically are they going to have about buying real estate in San Miguel? Well, generally they ask this, can I own it? And how does the process work? Um, a lot of them ask if there's financing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the biggest issue about Mexico and San Miguel in mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. um, 95% of all of our purchases are with cash. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not financed. Um, 
many people are still taking an, an equity loan against a property they have in the U.S. and pulling some money out of there, or they just sell their property and whatever equity they get out of their property in the U.S. they purchase here. There is financing here, and it's it's you know it kind of adds 30 days to the process. It's pretty easy to get. The problem is the interest rates. Mm -hmm. And a screaming great interest rate in Mexico on a mortgage would be 9%. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. And so um, I've talked to, you know, several bankers that are higher up the the food chain, you know, and I'm saying, okay, come on, tell me what, you know, what's the bank paying for the money? And the bankers are telling me that they're having to, to pay 5 to 6% mm, for the money. Really? And so it's not... When I first arrived here, I just kind of assumed it was, oh, the greedy bankers. <laughs> but no, I think it's just the, you know, the U.S. and Canada, well, they used to have a AAA rating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, but the country of Mexico does not. Mm. And so the cost of the money to the banks is a lot higher than in the U.S. So most of our purchases, though, are, are cash. I see. So you say financing is available. Uh, are they going through a, a local bank? Ve very do? rarely oh. do do uh, foreigners do the bank financing. Okay. Um, there are some private individuals that finance. That we do maybe, I don't know, maybe 20% of our transactions have some form of owner financing. Hmm. And, but usually that's a more like a bridge loan. Mm. So, you know, one to maybe the maximum of five years. I mean, we have written some 10, 15 year owner financing, but the majority of it, it's like, well, grandmother's estate will settle in a couple of years, or we have a house for sale and we have this much cash and we need some kind of bridge financing until the house sells. And, but so, uh, as you know, you, you've been able to look over the numbers. Uh, I would think that a market that has such a, a high amount of cash financing, uh, you know, uh, compared to like the United States, when you do have a big credit squeeze like we saw in 2007, 2008, you might see a dip, but nothing close to what you would in, in these places where financing is just given to everybody. Uh, I mean, did you see a, a lesser dip or was it the same as uh, some of these U.S. cities? No, we, as far as the purchases, uh, we saw a huge dip, mm. like 70% dip, uh, the next, and that took five years to rebuild. But again, it was like the whole, this whole equity line of credit dried up in the U S uh, people were seeing their home values go down by 20, 30, 40%, depending on what market they were coming from. And they just didn't have, and then their houses wouldn't sell. So it's like, yeah, well, I guess what I mean is housing prices. Right. That you, did you see a, a a drop in housing prices? Because I know another thing that to me it seems like a if if you're looking at buying investment real estate, it, somewhere with less liquidity might be more stable. Uh, because so, like for instance, here in Mexico, where you have very low property taxes, a lot of people use uh, real estate here for they have for a long time. Uh, it's kind of like a bank. And um, so, you know, in a time where housing prices go down, they just won't sell. They're, what are they, they're paying less than $500 a year in property tax anyways. So that would, uh, that plus the not, so, you know, not as many people speculating with this cheap money, I would think would cause a, uh, you know, a, a less volatile market. And, you know, you might not uh, end up losing so much on, on the value of your house as opposed to, I don't know, somewhere in Texas or, you know, like, like we saw in Florida. Well, actually, in the last crisis, it was almost the opposite. Is that right? Wow. Right. And he, but here's why. San Miguel had became, become the, the apple of the eye, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And probably between 1995 and 2005, there were thousands of international publications writing articles about San Miguel. Right. And San Miguel, there was a frenzy and the rich and famous were coming here. When we first arrived, they would say, oh, you'll see um, Goldie Hawn. And, <laughs> you know, the, it's like the famous people were coming here plus the non-famous. And it really got, the market got way overheated. And um, and so post-crisis, 
Today, we're probably down at least 30 and in some areas, 35% from the peak. I see. But it's back down to um, to a lot more realistic levels. Mm-hmm. And in fact, there's still some incredible bargains. San Miguel's a walking town. So within walking distance to Cintro, um, prices are fairly stable. They've bo- they kind of bottomed out, and then they've been stable. But prices f- uh, further out, like five, ten minutes out, you can still buy properties today for less than it would cost to replace them. Meaning, if you could buy the lot next door and reproduce the exact same house, you can buy it for less than replacement cost. Mm. So there's still a, a lot of great deals, but they tend to be out a little bit. Yeah, so it sounds like you've, uh, well, at least you did when you were first starting, uh, you did a lot of research on demographics. Uh, h- how do you see Mexico now uh, as far as, you know, you have places like Carretero close to here, Leon, where you have a, a, a really growing middle class where you, I haven't seen in any of the, uh, you know, anywhere in the United States, anywhere in Europe, hardly anywhere do you see an actual thriving, growing middle class. This is really an anomaly. And um, so uh, I know that a lot of uh, people from Monterey, Mexico City, have a lot of money. They come in here and they buy uh, high price houses. And, um, you, know, I, you know, I think your company kind of specializes in, well, not specializes, but you have a lot of these baby boomer, maybe the gringo market, you say. But there's still a lot of Mexicans coming here and buying as well from uh, these places. Do you see, um, do, do you think that maybe the Mexican middle class will overtake, overtake the uh, the Americans here? Is that what we're seeing? Well, I don't think the Mexican middle class will overtake the Americans because it's still what the, even the retirees on a pretty modest income with, a, with maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars, that's still above the reach of the Mexican middle class. Mm. That's kind of the top of the Mexican middle class. But, um, yeah, I, I moved here basically ba- based on the demographics of the baby boomers, both of Americans, Canadians, but also Mexicans. I mean, Mexico had a huge baby boom as well. The, really, the whole world did. I, I moved here based on that. And what has changed is the industry in, uh, in Mexico is just roaring. And like, I would have never dreamed this. Mexico is the second largest producer of flat screens in the world. It's like, who would have thought that? It's like, well, yes, I knew they built refrigerators. They have the second largest aerospace industry in the world. Right now, San Miguel is also beginning to get this, um, uh, they just inaugurated a new industrial park and we're seeing more and more activity regarding industry. And here's why. Within a circle around San Miguel of up to three hours away, but most are saying an hour and a half to two, there's GM, BMW, right. Volkswagen, Hyundai. Like they, there's 5,000 Japanese that have moved to Salaya, which is 40 minutes away. 5,000. And the this whole... But San Miguel seems to be in the midst of this arrows of, of the auto industry. And so what we're seeing now is a lot of interest from small manufacturers and suppliers that want to make, you know, some wiring harness or a harness or a door handle, but they're going to make it for both Volkswagen and Honda and GM. And, and so San, uh, San Miguel's kind of the hub. And Corretro, you mentioned also, that's like 50 minutes away. Um, it has been the second fastest growing city in Mexico for like right. seven years. And it is just impressive. Population like 2 million, I think. Yeah, some, 2 million, I think. And, um, and so, you know, I kind of moved here for the baby boomers. But boy, we're, you know, I, in a sense, it's like I kind of hit the lottery because there's all this other activity going on as well that will just make our market more stable. You know, what I think is really cool, we're about, I think, 40 minutes into this interview with Philip Hardcastle of Realty San Miguel, and we're talking about all sorts of things, his history and also about real estate in Mexico. 
And uh, we have not once brought up anything about drug cartels. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, it, this, this is a question people have too, don't they? You know, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, believe me. Right. But, uh, you know, that, that is a, a persistent idea that people have in the States. In a minute or less, what would you say to them if they had that concern? Um, it's a concern, but it's really, it's not a concern. You know, my neighbor was robbed at gunpoint in Richardson, Texas. Mm -hmm. My next door neighbor, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And fortunately, we're not on the main corridor where the trafficking occurs. Most, you know, most of the violence is towards the border or come of, uh, the growing areas or production areas. And so we, yes, it's here. And yes, it's not as safe as it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, I haven't taken out an insurance policy and I am have no plans on leaving. Uh, you know, it's like San Miguel probably has one twentieth of the, or maybe even one fiftieth of the crime rate of Chicago. Right. You know, by comparison. Yeah. But, you know, when we first moved here, uh, my daughter... Maybe I shouldn't say this. I, <laughs> it's, okay. I, it's too late. I can't get arrested no. now. But <laughs> my daughter was six. Uh -huh. And by the time she's seven, as long as she was with two or three other girls her age, mm -hmm. we felt comfortable them walking around town. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how safe it was mm -hmm. when we first moved here. Right. And so anyway, right. I used up the minute. Yeah. No, you did. And uh, it was great. I appreciate you uh, dealing with that. So now... The reality is, uh, for a lot of people that we communicate with regularly, you know, there, like you said, you know, there, there can be some baby boomers coming over here. They've got a little bit of an income, but it isn't quite what they want it to be. They can start a business. It's not super profitable, but it's helping out a lot. What, you know, what would you say to them about what advice would you have to someone thinking about leaving their home country, coming to San Miguel de Allende and starting their own business? What is the most important piece of advice that you would give to them? Ooh, I don't know if I could give just one important, but let me just kind of r ramble. Good. Let me think out loud. Okay. Um, if I was doing it over again, that's the easiest way for me to look at it. Um, and in fact, I'm even thinking along these lines right now. If there's any way possible to create some kind of business where you're doing it online or from a distance or by telephone, like, Jonathan, you're sitting here, we're sitting in your studio in San Miguel de Allende, but your clients are pay, are in the U.S. and elsewhere, and they're paying you in dollars. Mm -hmm. So you get the dollars as income, and you get to live the lifestyle in pesos. Absolutely. Right? So you're living at, what, a third of what it would cost you to live wherever in the United States. Something like that. And you can do it from a distance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're really in a new, you know, the last 20 years, we're in the information age. Um, and it's not because of Mexico or San Miguel or anything else. It's about freedom. Mm. Um, if people could come up with an idea of some kind of business they could do from a distance, and particularly if they can earn U.S. dollars or euros or Canadian dollars, but you get to live someplace where it's incredibly cheap, but the lifestyle is great. I can't think of a better combination. But that's, you know, for me, I'm not a techie guy. It's like, that's not going to happen that easy. So the, so really from the way I look at the business is I think you've just got to kind of find your niche and find what would work for you and look at some different options and go do the market research. And see, when I say market research, it's mm -hmm. like I couldn't have presented any market research that I did to an investment group, mm -hmm. and they would have taken me as a credible person. <laughs> but you know, I did. I went and walked the streets. I talked to people, and and I went with my gut. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a there's a lot of opportunities for people. I am making some of my money in dollars and some in pesos. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm fortunate in that way. But there's many people here. Like, for instance, there's one couple that they have a store. They probably opened it eight years ago or nine. And all they're doing is high-end betting. Mm. 
like when I first moved here, you could not get cotton sheets. Right. You know, they were half acrylic or polyester or something, you know, and, but they, but now you can get cotton sheets in Costco, you know, you can buy them in a six pack or whatever. So their, their focus has gone more to the higher end stuff with thousand thread count sheets, whatever. And I don't think they need a full income. I th- it might be a third of an income or maybe a half an income mm-hmm. and it's a great little business. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's perfect for retirees and I still think there's a hundred businesses here that would be viable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, what the what you were saying about making money in, in uh, a place where uh, the cost of living is much higher and then living in a place where it's much lower they actually have a name for that, the, the clipper ship strategy. There's a, a guy named Uncle Eric who wrote this set of books for homeschooling, and uh, it's about to teach kids how to, uh, you know, what to do with money. And the end book is called the clipper ship strategy, and it's very uh, interesting. He talks about how uh, when the, they had the gold rush, they had these ships, and they needed to go. They, they would usually live in New York or in the East Coast, and they needed to get the gold from California. And the quicker they could do it the more money that they would make. So they made the most streamlined ships that the world had ever seen at the time. And basically what they were doing is they were taking advantage of this because the all the co- the prices were very high where the gold rush was. And they were very low where they, they normally lived. So they would be earning their money in a, in a, a, a place uh, that... Because it's not necessarily the, the fact that it's dollars it's the fact that the cost of living is much higher so that means wages and everything is higher so you make money there and then you spend it in another place and he and so he writes about different ways that you know he suggested to do this 20 years ago but um and i have a, a link on the website if anybody's interested on the i have a, a books tab on the borderless blog website but uh, i think that this type of strategy i mean now it's so easy to do like you said on the internet um you know and and you can uh basically live where you want to if you can create one of these location uh, independent businesses uh now is just uh, an unprecedented time i think that there's no time in history that it's it's uh it's easier to do that so yeah you know the other thing is that um that i think most people don't realize when we talk about well just the cost of living so cheap let me give you an example i moved here with my family today the insurance policy I was paying $800 a month for in the U.S., to, even though it's increased every year, today I pay about $3,000 a year for the same Blue um, Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's not Blue Cross Blue Shield, but I pay for the same policy. I could cut that by a third if I opted out of ever being treated in the U.S. or Canada. Mm. So... Basically, my worldwide health insurance, which is more major medical, I can be treated anywhere in the world. And if I wanted to opt out of ever being treated in the U.S. or Canada, I could probably get that for maybe $2,200 or something like that. Car insurance is half. Um, Yes, you add in some travel cost, but then you own a house and you're paying almost nothing in property taxes. You're... You, the maintenance on a concrete house there you know brick and plaster and concrete there's just not that much we're living here where oh there's more and more people have some kind of split system air conditioners but really you don't have to use them you don't so, and he's right folks I, believe me coming from phoenix eight years i didn't believe it he's right you do not need air conditioning in this town. really uh, i would 30 days a year it'd be mm-hmm. nice to have it um and and also it's like even in the winter time yes you use a heater but most winter days it's 70 degrees in the day so it warms up and so when you start looking at a location it's like for example you couldn't say that on the utilities for moving to the beach right but here we are at 6000 feet in the mountains the this is why san miguel will be so great because the climate is so great all of that just adds to the cost of living or decreases the cost of living, I guess. Okay. So you've been listening to Philip Hardcastle, owner and director of Realty San Miguel, uh, a guy who likes to be just a little bit uncomfortable. That might be the secret to his success. 
and the various places he's lived and done business. And so it's just another example of how you can do this too if you want to. Does the idea of living outside of the United States for any reason sound attractive to you? Do you like the idea of living, uh, you know, with American dollars but spending pesos, meaning that you're cutting a significant portion out of your your budget? Well, you can do it too if you want to, and we hope to be a resource for you in discovering ways that you yourself can do it. James, anything to add? No, I think that's uh, that's it. But uh, thanks for for coming by. I think it's been great talking to you and. Um... You know, maybe we'll have you on again sometime, but uh, it's been great talking to you, and I'm sure I'll see you around. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Phil. Thanks for joining us for the Borderless Podcast, traveling, investing, and living beyond borders.